I'm nervous and I'm excited. This is my first talk physically being present in three years' time, but actually this is what emotional intelligence is about. So emotional intelligence this is defined as being aware of our emotions, understanding them, analyzing them, but also being able to control them and regulate them. So emotional intelligence was popularized by Goldman in his book in 95. He defined it and obviously introduced it to the masses. And what really relates to what I'm going to talk about is this quote here. What really matters for success, character, happiness and lifelong achievements is a definite set of emotional skills, your EQ. Not just purely cognitive abilities that are measured by conventional IQ tests. So, emotional intelligence relates to all these different things, so it is important for success and even happiness in your life. But Goldman was not the first one to realize this. Already, if you look at Oscar Wilde's book, in this case, The Picture of Dorian Gray, we see that he stated there, I don't want to be at the mercy of my emotions. I want to use them, to enjoy them, and to dominate them. And this is exactly what emotional intelligence is about again. And people have known about it, as we can see, uh, early on. So how do we go from emotional intelligence to expressing and understanding our emotions? There are many theories related to understanding emotions. And in fact, even the definition of emotions is not still totally agreed upon by researchers, even after over 100 years of research. But probably and arguably one of the first people to analyze and try to understand and investigate emotions is Charles Darwin. So he traveled extensively and he was interested in the evolution theory, but he also was interested in how people express emotions. And not just people, even animals. But he took this evolutionary uh, perspective. For example, he, he said that to be able to express surprise, in fact, related to certain evolutionary goals. If we open our mouth and you know, we widen our field of view, it puts us on an alert state, so we are now ready in case something happens, maybe we need to flee. Or, for instance, the expression of anger, particularly with animals showing teeth or having a posture that sort of widens and increases your, uh, uh, the, the space you capture, is actually meant to scare the opponent. So he really took this evolutionary perspective and he approached from that sense. But since then, many researchers investigated emotions from different perspectives and our understanding has deepened. And now, we know that emotions actually are much more complex than that. And they really impact our decision-making process, our memory, our attention. One of the most modern theories is the appraisal theory. So what the appraisal theory states is, and I'll try to give it with an example, that emotions are actually a multi-componential process that you know, is impacted by various factors. So let's imagine that you're in the Canadian woods and you're going for a stroll and then a bear sort of appears. So what you're going to feel and what you're going to express? This will depend on who you are. So are you a researcher who is interested in bears and has been planning to be there and finding the bear? Or are you someone that just went for a stroll and wasn't expecting to see a bear and suddenly the bear appeared and you're scared. So all of these things actually depend on various factors. For instance, whether we are expecting the bear to appear or not, whether it's congruent with our goals, whether, for instance, we, we know what the outcome probability is of the situation, uh, and also whether we have a coping potential, so are we able to deal with the situation. So depending on what responses or values we give to these factors, what we feel, will be different. So we might even feel joy if we were expecting it, but we might feel fear 
and we might even start preparing some course of action to flee, if that's what we are feeling. So the most modern approach for emotions is then really this multi-componential aspect where emotions are defined as a complex phenomena that is impacted by cognition, physiology and expression, and also actually these, all of them impact one another. So cognition, obviously, the way we, we process, and physiology, for instance, how our body, our breathing, even the posture we take might impact the emotion. So not just our thinking, but if we stand tall and you know, we actually breathe in, in a calmer way, we might start feeling calmer, so our physiology impacts emotions. But even the expression, so if we smile, even though we are not happy after a while, it might actually make us feel a bit uh, more joyful. So it's really this complex uh, approach with multiple components. Now, from these definitions and theories, let's move to the expression of emotions. How do we actually express and perceive emotions? There are many different uh, channels for expressing emotions. So physiology is definitely one, as we mentioned. For instance, our breathing, even heart rate, the uh, electrodermal activity, so whether we are sweating or not, even the brain signals, so we can perceive and sense some signals related to emotions from all of these physiological aspects that are unseen to people, so they're more implicit and hidden, so to say, but they're also more perceivable and explicit aspects like our talking, for instance, silences, the pitch, the words we use, but also other aspects, particularly the visual channel. So the visual channel is arguably is the most important one for communicating emotions. And we have various things. So we have our body, so body posture, gestures, even gait, the way we walk could communicate uh, emotions. But our face is the most social and the most important channel or source for communicating emotions. And again, there are various theories about this, but particularly Ekman and his colleagues popularized this view that as humans, we can express emotions with basic emotion categories that are universally recognized across the world. And he defined this as these six categories of fear, anger, sadness, disgust, joy, and surprise. As you can see here, though, these expressions are quite exaggerated, fully blown. And in daily life, this is not how we express emotions. Children might express this way, and we might express to children in this way so that they understand. But in daily life, things, the way we express is much more subtle. For instance, also we don't have particular combination of features for each and every emotion. O oh is one example. How do we express O? Oh? Or embarrassment, guilt, pain. Therefore, Ekman and colleagues also came up with this facial action coding system. So this system aims to be an objective way of categorizing how we do various expressions with our face, moving the muscles. And they came up with 44 action units. So each action unit actually corresponds to a particular muscle movement of the face. For instance, facial action unit one would be increasing or lifting the inner eyebrow up. And facial action unit two would be lifting the outer eyebrow up. And if I lift both of them, this would be action unit one plus two. And then you can attribute at a higher level these two uh, categories such as surprise. And here you see some different combinations of action units, both in animals and humans. So this facial action coding system provides a good tool for categorizing every single muscle movement and its combinations on the face in an objective manner. And then we can assign high-level interpretations. So how do we get from all of this to creating technology with emotional intelligence? Well, the motivation is, in fact, human-human interaction. And here, the key word is interaction. Because when we interact with technology, obviously, there is an interaction happening. And that's exactly what motivates us in human-human interaction. So there is a source and or resender of the signals and the receiver of the signals. 
So here you see how the sender of the signals consciously or unconsciously would generate various um, cues that are interpreted at the receiver end for various functions. Again, consciously or unconsciously. So even the way we use our space, the way we gesture, the way we talk, the way we orient ourselves, all of these send certain signals to the perceiver end or the receiver end. And the receiver would actually make judgments whether they could trust that person, what their first impression is of that person, what sort of feeling or emotion this person is communicating, whether they believe what this person is saying. So this type of interaction motivates also technology-human or human-technology interaction. So if you replace the sender end of these signals with a machine, so to say, and this could be computers, mobile phones, or robots, then what happens on the receiver end? You know, that's actually the, the research question. And it does relate to the attribution process. So let us just watch this video for a while. So I'll stop the video here, but you get the sense. So here, what happens is, as humans, actually, we tend to attribute certain properties even to objects that are not human-looking, that are not humanoid. So here we have two, uh, two triangles and one circle, and because of certain movement characteristics, you start attributing, oh, this uh, triangle is the friend of the circle, and the other one is sort of the aggressive one that is trying to attack the circle, oh, is it going to catch, oh, poor circle needs to move out. So, you know, you start attributing various adjectives and properties of a good guy, bad guy type of thing. And researchers, in fact, um, uh, uh, Reeves and Naus, in their book, The Media Equation, exactly refer to this. So we as humans tend to attribute such characteristics to technology. So this could be in terms of physical appearance, we attribute personality, uh, certain adjectives, whether it's a good or bad one, we feel certain emotions because of that technology or towards that technology. And these do not have to be even human-looking or in human form. One example is when we interact with voice technology, so for instance, that gives us directions, doesn't have any physical appearance, but already we would start attributing certain characteristics. And this really motivates uh, in terms of building technology because we actually, as designers and engineers, need to make sure that we try to monitor what sort of attribution will be happening and we try to guide that towards what we would like the users to perceive. So let's look at now at gradual sort of complexity, how emotional intelligence would be in the context of technology. So here is computers with no emotional intelligence at all. Uh, if, uh, like me, you're old enough to remember uh, early <laughs> operating systems, you might have seen such messages with lots of um, uh, you know, characters, but not really telling you much. So the, we would say that actually this does not have much emotional intelligence. And in fact, Rosalind Picard is quoted to have said, I wonder if in part why so many people are angry at Microsoft is not just because their products frustrate them so much, but also because this frustration is ignored. The computer makes people feel like they're dummies, when in fact, it is the computer that is stupid. So from here, let's now start looking at some examples where there is some emotional intelligence in the technology or the app. So here is one. So we start seeing differences here because actually there is even this icon like a face that is sad. 
and is explaining what has happened. Something went wrong while displaying this web page, and it tells you even what to do to continue what you can do as next thing, or if you want some more information, what you can do. Similarly, with uh, applications like Skype, you would see the same. So you would see, for instance, again here, there is a face with an expression, oops, something went wrong at our end. So this is really important. Actually, the app is taking responsibility for itself and not expecting you to understand everything as a user. And again, it provides more information as to what you can do. Another example is, if you remember, uh, before using mobile phones as cameras, in actual cameras, you would have these shutters, particularly smile shutter. So, uh, you know, if you use this camera, as soon as there is a smiley face, the, the photo can be snapped automatically without you do uh, something yourself. Particularly for children who are so active, you know, you could actually appreciate such technology. Here, some emotional intelligence comes from the sensing aspect. So there is actually uh, the capability in this camera to detect a face and the smiley face and take an action, even though it's simplistic, like snapping a, a photo. So from here, now we come to a field called effective computing. So this is now much more complex, and the field was uh, defined and created by uh, Professor Rosalind Picard uh, at MIT. So she wrote this seminal book, Effective Computing, and the reason was, just as the quote I, sh I have shown, she realized, particularly in computing, there was this tendency towards IQ, what we mentioned from Goldman's book, and not so much towards EQ. So it was um, a bit skewed. So uh, she wanted to have or introduce or equip computers and machines with some emotional intelligence. And here we see actually what effective computing encapsulates in the figure. So we see even understanding human-human interaction, having the user at the center, so sensing this user, but also uh, understanding based on what the user is expressing, and even creating various applications with this in mind, but also having emotion generation or expression generation capabilities on the machine side. I'm going to open up this now a little bit more in terms of different components. So here we have a user, um, and they're sort of trying to interact with an architecture. To be able to then start creating this or embed emotional intelligence into technology, we first need to sense the user. And this can be done with various sensors like cameras, microphones, even physiological sensors that the, the user can wear. This is also sometimes known as perception. Then, after sensing, we need to be able to have some data to be able to then uh, teach uh, machines or computers about emotional intelligence. And we need to be able to use the models from different fields, like the models I explained. So this comes from psychology, cognitive science. And data can be obtained via the internet or elsewhere, or depending on our application, we might need to acquire our own data. We also need annotations or labels for this data. As a next step, we need to extract some features from this data that can be used or interpreted by machines, and use these features then to create models to train or make sure the machine learns uh, about emotions. And sometimes these are actually combined together with deep learning models. But just here, for instance, detecting a smile is not sufficient, because we need to be able to understand whether this smile is a smile of embarrassment, or is a smile of uh, enjoyment or joy. How do we do that? We need to understand the context. And context is a very complex and still an open research problem. What it means is to be able to answer these big W5 plus questions of who the user is, where they are, what their task is, even with whom they are. And the more we can answer these questions, the more we can understand the context, and then come up with a context-sensitive interpretation, and therefore also create context-sensitive responding on the machine side. So in this case, for instance, this architecture creates certain action. And this interaction continues, what we call as closed-loop interaction. So we keep sensing the user, interpreting, and then generating certain action on the technology side. So I will try to give some examples now. Uh, in terms of putting this into action. 
So the first one is how do we create um, artificially sort of uh, emotional intelligence or how do we embed artificial emotional intelligence in architecture? So for this, um, the setting is uh, London Olympics in 2012 and uh, architecture is the London Eye. So how London Eye can be turned into an empathic uh, architecture. So here are some of the, these steps. Of course, we need to take care in terms of the actual hardware aspects of the eye. So we need to have some, for instance, bulbs to be able to have some lighting and estimation as it rotates. But then on the user side, we need to be able to sense the user. So here it's done using Kinect cameras um, to sense their movements and gestures but also the user is asked to wear a heart monitor, a small one that they can clip onto their ear and uh, on their body. And the user is being sensed by these two uh, sensors and at the same time we have obviously servers that communicate with both the eye and the user sensing and coordinate things in order to create responsiveness. So let's look at, at examples now in terms of designing this response. So on the London Eye side, to make it uh, empathic and responsive, three different adaptation strategies were designed. So the first one is called WAVE, and this ba is based on sensing the user and, and understanding that the user is more or less calm and relaxed, with low heart rate and relatively smooth movements. In that case, there is not that much lighting on the eye. The second one is called spectrum. So here the mood is more flamboyant and with medium heart rate and unique gestures. And there are many more colors, a bit like the rainbow. And the last one is called fire. So this is based on energetic mood, so heart rate relatively higher. And also uh, the movements are quite expansive. And that way, we have these three different ways of adaptation in terms of the eye. Here you see their heart rate actually projected on top of the eye as well. Beating. Then this is also how human, uh, actually humans interacted with the eye. They were not told what to do. Uh, it was a setup at night and uh, lasted uh, during the duration of the Olympics. So they could do anything and see how actually their movements would be interpreted and how the eye <laughs> would, uh, you know, respond. So you can see very unique movements and ways of interacting. So one thing they commented, and we gathered a lot of data and analyzed this, but one thing that uh, people said when they were after interacting with, uh, with the, this installation is that they felt quite empowered because London Eye is an icon uh, for London. And to be able to control it and having these responses from the eye to their movements, they felt really empowered. So this was one experience they shared. So they really felt there was some empathic aspect so the second thing I want to ask is how actually we create uh, artificial emotional intelligence for cognitive training. So now I'm moving gradually from less complex systems in terms of perception uh, and then learning and then adaptation to increasing the complexity. So cognitive training has been found quite useful for particularly memory-related um, disorders. 
uh, or, or uh, health-related issues. For instance, early dementia or the dementia-related aspects, but also attention like ADHD or learning-related um, disabilities. Um, we work with neuroscientists, and what they said is that cognitive training, in fact, has been found useful for such um, uh, disabilities. Uh, however, the problem is adherence. So these people are given certain exercises and they need to do this training. And computerized ways definitely help, so they find it more engaging, but still adherence is low. And we decided to actually uh, investigate whether we can use virtual reality for this problem. Because virtual reality is immersive and it gives this sensation to the users that they are there in that particular environment. So, we also wanted to create environments that are realistic, so people would definitely go you know, to supermarkets and museums and so on. So, for working memory tasks, we created an environment like um, a, a supermarket. Here you see the person wearing the virtual headset, has two controllers, and then they can actually see uh, the environment, and they're tasked with a list of things that they need to remember to buy in that supermarket. They can move around, and they can pick up items, and as they pick up the correct items, they get certain score, and there's different di difficulty level. Depending on that, the number of items they need to remember would vary. The second one is for episodic memory, and in this case, the user is in a museum, and they start moving around, and certain items in the museum are marked because they're going to be taken away or they will disappear. And the user needs to remember where these items were. So after a while, they're taken back to the entrance of the museum and now they need to move around and remember where these items were. And depending on whether they remember this correctly or incorrectly, they get certain points. Again, the difficulty level would vary uh, with number of items. Um, so again, following the process I introduced before, um, we go through these different steps. In terms of data acquisition, we wanted to actually introduce emotional intelligence. And we know that the face is very expressive. But in a VR setup, part of the face is occluded. So how do we tackle that? So in collaboration with MTech, it's a company here in the UK, we actually used a headset that had these facial EMG sensors inside it. And that way, we could sense what's happening with various facial muscles while they interact. And once they interacted, we also asked them to tell us how they felt in terms of positivity, negativity, and calmness and stress level. So this provided us the labels. So here, then, as the next step is, we extracted certain features from these EMG sensors to represent what uh, various movements were inside the headset and we trained models to recognize their valence and arousal level. And we, we got fairly uh, good um, accuracy for this particular setup, because they're moving a lot as well. But then, then um, we need to move towards adaptation, using this sensing of the emotions, and how do we do that? So we rely on this theory of flow, and what this theory states is, Particularly in a gaming environment, for instance, if people's capabilities are used to their fullest without forcing them to go beyond their capability, they will stay in this zone called flow. But if they feel their capability is not being, or their potential is not being used to the fullest, they will start falling into the boredom region. Or if they feel they're being forced to go well beyond their potential or capability, they will start feeling anxious. So the goal is to keep the user in this state of flow as much as possible. And for us, to do that, we wanted to create adaptation. And here, we know the context is the environment, and there are certain scores based on what they remember. And based on this, we actually adapt the environment as they interact as well. And adaptation in this case was a rule-based adaptation. So we have certain rules. For instance, if the person is calm, but they're showing some signs of negativity. And even if their score is perfect, we, we then would actually um, increment the difficulty by two, because they're, they're um, performing uh, in, in the perfect score. So even though they're feeling negative, it hasn't affected their performance. 
Another example is, for instance, if they're in a positive state and their score is imperfect, you wouldn't change the difficulty. So this was done by experimenting with a, a number of users. Then, what we did was we created an adaptive and non-adaptive version of the game. And with the help of the neuroscientists, we actually invited uh, elderly people to interact with these both versions in a randomized manner. And here there, are, there is a bit of information in terms of numbers, but what we see in summary is that in the adaptive version, people had this increased feeling of competence. And although there was some decreased feeling of challenge, uh, this came with increased feeling of flow. So overall, in fact, we find that the adaptive version has potential to be used for cognitive training in, in this dynamic way of adaptation for each user. The next thing I want to look at now, again increasing the complexity in terms of perception, learning and action, is um, embodied agents and robots. So how do we actually create uh, or embed artificial emotional intelligence into the agents and the robots? Again, if you remember this uh, figure uh, that I introduced now, we are also replacing the receiver end with the machine. So, you know, we have the human uh, as the sender of these signals, and now the machine needs to be able to interpret these signals. But also, we have the other way around. We have the machine as the sender of these signals, and the human interactant constantly evaluates or assesses these signals as well as the interaction is happening. And here are some examples of already sort of uh, using them in different settings. So for learning and education, robots are being already experimented with, particularly, for instance, with children, even children who have autism um, in an assistive manner, and also in collaborative settings, as well as museums and even uh, shopping malls and shops to, again, entertain, assist and guide uh, children, but also customers. We also see them in therapeutic simulation and care. So here you see in elderly care homes. And also more futuristic applications, using them as coach and companion at home. But even, for instance, here a drone flying with a person who is um, jogging as a coach to sort of you know, keep them motivated and <laughs> keep them uh, going with their running. So in all of these different applications and examples, Actually, believability is the most important thing, and that's the key. Then how do we create believable agents and robots? Appearance is very important, and appearance can vary. So the agent can be very mechanical or machine-looking, or it can be human, uh, can be uh, animal, zoomorphic looking. Here you see as a dog. And further, it can look like a human, which we call humanoid robot or humanoid, humanoid agent, having human appearance such as arms, two arms, two legs, head, eyes, and so on. But appearance alone is not enough. So behavior should match that appearance. For instance, this uh, seal-looking robot should actually create seal-looking behaviors. For instance, when the human touches um, or pats, should actually vibrate and create sounds like a seal. Again, also with humanoid robots, should be able to hold its body like a human and gesture and respond like a human to make itself believable. But beyond that, um, the inspiration here comes from Disney, actually. Beyond that, what is important is, in fact, the portrayal of emotions. And it has been the portrayal of emotions that has given the Disney characters the illusion of life. So Disney has used this. Uh, they have known about it and have used it. So here is one example. I'm not sure if uh, how many of you have seen this movie, but it's called Inside Out, and it's about emotions. Um, here you see, and you can apply this theory that I just mentioned. So you see the appearance of these different five emotion characters. Uh, but also you get to sort of understand a bit about their behavior, even if it's not a movie, even if it's just a static frame. So, for instance, you could perhaps deduce already that the character in the middle is happiness, the way she's holding her herself, and uh, the character in red is representing anger, the emotion anger, and so on. So similar uh, aspects have been used to create also virtual agents. 
So this is an example from a European Union project uh, called Sensitive Artificial Listeners. The goal was sort of similar. Instead of those five emotions, here we have four characters. So we have Poppy, who is happy. We have Spike, who is angry. And then we have Ubadaya, who is sad and depressed, and Prudence, who is pragmatic. And the goal here was to create the first fully autonomous um, agent architecture that would be able to interact with the users based on just their nonverbal behaviors and expressions, and then would respond to them in a, man in a manner um, by trying to move that person's emotional state closer to their own. For instance, if it's Spike, he would try to make you angry. That would be the goal. So again, um, how do we do that? Uh, the, the pipeline is sort of similar to what I introduced, but slightly different. So we need to sense the user. And here it's done by using camera and microphone. And we need to extract certain features and analyze those. And because we have multiple modalities, these need to be consolidated and fused. Then we have the dialogue management aspect that keeps track of the state of the user the state of the agent, but also the state of the dialogue. And based on this, decides to tell the generation component what sort of uh, behavior and gestures and uh, speech should be generated on the agent side, knowing which agent the person is interacting with. Here's an example. I'm Spike. What's your problem? I don't have a problem. Is that so? Tell me about it. Well, you know, nothing's going terribly wrong. I suppose you wrong. really think you're something. No, not really. How can you believe that? Quite easily. I'm not up myself, I'm not spoiled. So, I'm just pausing here. So, Spike actually, <laughs> as we said, will try to make the person angry. And the way he will try to do that is, obviously, there is this sensing aspect. So, the system is able to sense what the user is expressing. So, if the person is nodding their head, Spike will actually shake its head because it's trying to do the opposing things to make the person angry. Just continue for a bit. I think then. you're wrong to be so pragmatic about it all. Really? Well, you're not always right. I'm not always right. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so this, <laughs> so this interaction keeps going. <laughs> I I won't uh, take the the whole uh, time to show you how Spike can really make the user angry, uh, but uh, there is a reason in the in the madness of creating such agents. So such agents. Uh, uh, this was a proof of concept, uh, and it was the first fully autonomous system to be able to actually interact in such a way. But later, other researchers created such architectures to be used, for instance, for healthcare. And here, um, I'm not going to play the video, but is an example where such analysis of various behaviors can be used in clinical settings to assist, in fact, um, and create even virtual coaches um, and for various uh, um, applications, context and target user groups, because some users, um, some target user groups might not be, in fact, too willing to go to a psychologist. Similar uh, type of interactions can be created with a similar pipeline also with, uh, with robots. So I'll show you an example from our science communication. Uh, we have done a lot of uh, these uh, live demos. And I'll give you just a bit of background. So here, um, the robot, in fact, is a small child-looking robot. Doesn't really um, have too many facial features, so doesn't have... Uh, eyebrows, cannot really move the eyes or the mouth. So the goal is it uh, plays an emotional intelligence game with the user and asks the user to teach him how to display certain expressions. Yes, that's great. 
and getting better at this. <laughs> So it, it will again continue. So now I again want to move, uh, increasing the complexity further, I want to move towards um, uh, creating further adaptation on the robot side and give you an example of how we can create uh, emotionally intelligent robo-waiters. So uh, here the motivation again comes from the fact that we envisage robots to be taking part in society in different roles, so they already are actually, particularly in Japan, experimented uh, even in setups like a bank or uh, a restaurant setting, uh, where we can use them also for service industry. In this particular case, we are interested in humanoid robots, so human-looking robots, and we wanted to create a robo-waiter, a robo-waiter that also is able to adapt to various users, uh, even looking at their expressions. And how can we do that? So that was the, the question. So the first thing we wanted to actually do was create a virtual setup. And here you see actually such a setup. So let's say this is the restaurant setting. There is a customer table, and the customer is seated on this table. And we vary the robot's movements and positions randomly across different places. And we want to know how people perceive actually when the robot is positioned in those places. To be able to do that, we actually gathered the intelligence of the crowd. So we created all of these different variations and then asked people to provide us ratings in terms of how appropriate the positioning of the robot would be if this was a restaurant setting and they were the person seated on that table. And also, in terms of emotions, how they would feel actually, um, in terms of positivity, negativity, but also in terms of arousal, which uh, relates to being calm or stressed. Here are some uh, examples of information gathered from the crowd. So the green that you see is in terms of position, what they thought was acceptable for the robot to be. And you see actually it's mostly in front of them and partially to the side. And you see the back side actually is uh, really seen as not appropriate. Uh, I haven't done waitering, so I don't know this myself, but one researcher, when we presented this, he said he was um, doing waitering while he was at university, and they were told, in fact, to approach the person not head-on from the front, but mostly from the back. So we see how it is different when the robots are taking on such roles. So we learn these differences when we ask the crowd. We also looked at uh, effective uh, responses. So for instance, here for valence, how positive or negative they would feel depending on the positioning. You see again, they would feel positive mostly if the robot is positioned around again the front and the side. And again, they would feel negative if the robot was at the back. In terms of arousal, so this relates to being uh, anxious or stressed, you see actually you, they would be stressed, so the, the values are higher if the robot is behind them, and it would be lower if it's in front of them. So from such data, then, how can we learn uh, appropriate robot behaviors to act as a robovator? So what we did was we designed this problem as a reinforcement learning problem, and we are using here the top right quadrant to represent the restaurant setting, and the black that you see is actually the positioning of the table. Then we defined basically the robot to be able to do 12 different actions. So it can move up, down, left, right, uh, and also in varying three different speeds. And then we actually then uh, decided and we used the appropriateness ratings gathered from the crowd to reward the agent. So for each position and speeds, uh, the agent was uh, that state was rewarded based on using this um, position value matrix with, that we gathered. Here is the setup then, so this we learned from the virtual example, but how do actual humans interact with uh, a robot that is aiming to do this robo waitering? So the robot had four tasks. So first of all, it would introduce itself and welcome the person to Pepper's Diner, that's the name of the robot, and then it would take the order from a sort of a list, predefined list of options, and then would come back and provide, serve the customer, and later would come back and collect the dishes. So we had these different conditions. Um, 
we wanted to know if actually uh, learning uh, to adapt was valuable. So the first condition was really random positioning without learning anything. The second was the pre-trained condition where we trained the model with the data that we gathered virtually. And the last two are adaptive versions when the robot is interacting in real time and there's adaptation in real time happening. So we have explicit and implicit adaptation. So explicit feedback is based on spotting keywords and we have implicit feedback and that is based on looking and analyzing the facial affect, particularly valence, so positivity, negativity, and using as baseline how they express themselves during the introductory session. Then we modified the reward computation to use both the crowd uh, sourced appropriate, appropriateness ratings, but also implicit or explicit reward together. Then we evaluated in this user study and here I'll just summarize because there are lots of numbers. But in terms of enjoyment ratings, the first thing we see is that actually having learned behaviors is really beneficial as compared to having random or static behaviors. In terms of sociability, what we see is the adaptive versions are actually rated higher. And in particular, the explicit um, model or explicit uh, behaviors are rated uh, as much more social. Similar trend we see also for adaptation. Um, so we see actually uh, the implicit model being preferred when the people are asked, uh, the robot understood how they felt, and this was exactly the goal. And finally, for appropriateness ratings, again, we see that the adaptive versions are rated much higher. So from all of these different levels of complexity that I have shown, all the way from perception, learning, action, and even adaptation. Where are we going, actually? Where is this going? So the envisioned future we have um, in terms of um, uh, machines and agents and even uh, emotional technology in various forms is really um, a future of collaboration and coexistence. So we do not want, in fact, the machines to take over and replace humans. The envisioned future is really to coexist and co-evolve together. Um, we already see some of these applications in more uh, realistic uh, real-world settings. So one example is, for instance, Affectiva is probably the most well-known company in this field, has been recently bought by another company, but they invested a lot to create technology, uh, what they call emotion AI for autonomous vehicles. So in um, cabin entertainment as well, in cabin sensing, and using the sensing for adaptation. Beyond that, such machines or technology can also be used even for arts and entertainment. Um, so here I'm showing some examples, uh, and I have seen myself the Spilliken um, theater play where the robot was being used. So robots can actually appear already in uh, plays and even for dancing, but we need to bear in mind that they're not fully autonomous, so they're controlled in different ways. But still, seeing them coexisting in such manner uh, really is um, you know, very um, reassuring in certain ways and, and interesting as well. We learn different aspects from that. But even more importantly, we envisage these machines with emotional intelligence to be used also for particularly well-being. So for instance, helping with the assessment of well-being in children. We have an ongoing project about this but not only assessment, further in terms of helping them as companion in scary situations like, for instance, hospital settings, but even for other aspects related to, as I mentioned, for instance, autism, as well as uh, elderly, for stimulating elderly various senses and um, uh, encouraging, encouraging them to interact. So from all of these, then, the take-home message uh, is, first of all, uh, lifelong learning. So this uh, sounds a bit uh, coming from nowhere because I didn't mention it in my previous slides. What I would like to say is the technology I've been showing as examples so far actually uh, does not learn as humans do. So humans keep on learning throughout their life. So we keep learning, you know, starting from childhood, we keep learning different things. And 
As we learn, actually, we also use previously learned information to adapt to new environments, to new situations, to new people, to new interactions. So we keep using this information and we don't totally forget uh, everything that we learned in the past. So we utilize and keep adapting. But uh, current technology is not able to do that uh, the way humans do. Um, so, for instance, most of the examples I have shown you, they learn mostly um, once from predefined set of data, and when the situations change, users change, or even the tasks, context slightly change, they might not be able to adapt in, in, um, in an appropriate manner. So one thing is that we need to actually ensure we do embed lifelong learning capabilities into such emotionally intelligent technology. And this is something we are working in my group as well. The second take-home message I would like to mention is uh, we need to be mindful of the fact that when we say emotional intelligence for uh, artificial, uh, artificially uh, created systems like computers, uh, robots and so on, it might not necessarily be exactly as human emotional intelligence. So most of the time this is the expectation people have and therefore they get disappointed because when we say emotionally intelligent technology, they expect exactly how humans would do things, how humans would respond. But in fact, it does not have to be that way for artificial uh, systems. Also because as artificial systems evolve, their form will keep on changing. Uh, the robots of the future might not look exactly like the robots we have seen in movies. Uh, and particularly because we see such movies with you know, very sort of capable systems, our expectation when we see robots is really then to, to see those things exactly similar to the movies. But that's not where technology uh, has arrived currently. So this creates disappointment. And therefore, to manage expectations, we need to understand that it doesn't have to be exactly like human emotional intelligence. And the final one uh, relates to being aware of this emergence of human-machine core behavior. So what this means is uh, both humans and machines impact each other. So humans as engineers, programmers, designers, we shape machine behavior. So we make certain decisions and therefore we actually need to take responsibility as well while making those decisions uh, shaping machine behavior. For instance, you know, all this learning and behavior that I have shown you, it's learned from data. And data is never perfect, because if we use human data, we know humans are not perfect, they're not uniform, so things are noisy. And because we learn the models from noisy data, the models are not going to be perfect, and therefore there will be mistakes. And these mistakes will be also embedded in the machine behavior. So we do, as humans, shape machine behavior. We need to be aware of that. The second one is, okay, but machines also shape human behavior. So once we have the machines and the technology out there interacting with uh, various users, even most importantly generic audiences, they start shaping human behavior. So one example is, as I was showing, when we looked at robo-waiters, in fact, serving the people, and this was not even an actual restaurant setting, it was a lab study, we see how people's perception is different. They do not want the robot to be behind them, right? So if we start putting robots in restaurants, people's behaviors and expectations will change. It won't be exactly the same way. So therefore, actively, machines will change and are changing human behavior. Similarly, it was the case with, um, for instance, mobile phones as well. But most interestingly, by this sort of interaction, so humans shaping machine behaviors and machine also impacting human behaviors, there is this emergence of new behaviors, sometimes unforeseen in the design. Uh, so, for instance, I was showing how people interact with the London Eye. You know, people came up with all sorts of different gestures, right? And as actually our system was not pro probably able to you know, perceive all of these in its accurate form. So there is this all various things coming as unforeseen in the design. Therefore, we need to actually make sure that machine behavior is studied in a broader context. 
just like human behavior, you know, to understand humans, uh, they're anthropologists, social scientists, psychologists, emotion researchers looking at this. But machine behavior mostly is evaluated by people who create them. So, you know, computer scientists, engineers, and so on. So it really needs to be studied in a much broader context to be able to understand, but also uh, reshape in a desired manner so that we can uh, co-evolve with machines uh, that can serve us for the uh, for the better and um, for the good. <laughs> and um, with this, uh, I conclude my talk. And I would like to acknowledge my team throughout the years. Um, without them, this would not be possible. And thank you very much.